the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17. Appreciate your prayers. Yesterday, it's a pretty good day with my throat. Today, it's not doing so good. But, uh, this is just a test, and God is able. Amen. 1 Samuel, I'm going to use this as a pretext and uh, jump from here a little bit, but we'll start here. And uh, verses 8, 9, and 10. 1 Samuel 17, verses 8, 9, and 10. All right. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to save your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine? And ye servants to Saul, choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will I be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day, Give me a man that we may fight together. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we bow our heads in reverence to the wonderful and precious name of Christ our Lord. Pray that your will be done. I pray God you'll move upon us. Give us your touch. Help us to be found pleasing you. Those things we say today, God, we pray. Uh, thought about, meditated on the scripture and Father the message. I pray that it might, uh, Father, go where you need it to go. Uh, to our hearts and lives and forever home and family. Lord, and I pray, God, your blessing upon it. Speak to our heart and give us an altar service. Be it according to your precious will. I uh, thank God we say and do. We might always find ourselves in the sin of your will. Lord God, lean on, on you for your touch today. In Christ our Savior, in your precious name. And amen. Uh, the call throughout the ages. I don't know, you've probably heard uh, this title, uh, Give Me a Man, uh, from uh, Goliath. Give me a man that we may fight together. And that's been pretty much the call of the ages. But it, this one comes from the devil, kind of. Uh, but the one that uh, we often hear about in preaching uh, is uh, directed from God. Give me a man. And uh, then the other part of that is that uh, we read about a scripture where that we are looking for somebody, a man, to make up the head. Amen. And so the, uh, the devil is not able to get into needing somebody to take a stand and be strong in the things of God. And so I uh, thought about that and it being uh, uh, the uh, Sunday before the 4th of July and the freedom that we've got. We're looking for a man. Uh, Goliath wants to have a man that they can fight, uh, he can fight with, and defeat Israel uh, with by that one man. And here's got somebody that's near about a 10 foot tall and uh, probably weighs well over 400 pounds and uh, his arms as big as trees and a chest big enough to uh, waste a lot of metal on to cover him up. And you think about how big that he was and then he's looking down at the army of Israel and probably Saul, as we read in Scripture, was probably head and shoulders above most people. Uh, certainly we're not going to send out the king uh, to do the battle and Saul and Goliath was looking out and he sees all these people out there and probably nobody near as big as he was. And so he said, yeah, I'll fight your man. Bring him to me. I want us to look a little closer at a couple of these scriptures uh, for a pretext and get a little bit out of them uh, before we move on. And so Goliath is sitting or standing on the side of the hill and he cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, why are ye, all of y'all, Come out to set your battle in array. Why is everybody out here? He's making a challenge. He said, am not I a Philistine? And I represent all of the people that's on this battlefield that's Philistine. And he said, you the servants of Saul. And so you all represent the kingdom of Israel. And then Goliath says this, choose you, Israel, a man, somebody, uh, for you and let him come down uh, to me. So let's have a battle. I'll fight whoever you send. I uh, just bring him on. Verse 9. And if he, he be able to fight with me, which anybody could do, and to kill me, which is going to be a monumental task, and then will we be your servant? The word then, T-H-E-N, 
I underline under uh, my in my Bible under that word then uh, because it's conditional, right? He said, if you defeat us, then will we be your servants? We'll be subject to you. And but if I prevail against your man and kill him, then conditional shall ye be our servants and serve us. Now, before I go any further, let me just go ahead and say that that's a lie. All right, that's a lie. Goliath didn't mean that, and he had no way uh, that he could assure that the Philistine, uh, if he got defeated, which is unlikely, uh, is going to bow down and be the servants of Israel. In fact, we know the rest of the story. Amen? Uh, Goliath does de get defeated, and Israel chases the army of the Philistines back to where they come from, and they don't come and serve Israel by any means. And so the idea there was that we'll defeat you, you're not going to defeat us, and you'll be our servants, even if we've got to hunt you down and make you our servants. So uh, Goliath lied there when he said that. Verse 10, and the Philistine said, and here it is, I defy, I personally, individual, one, defy the entire armies of Israel this day. I'm standing against every one of you, and I declare that if you'll just send out one man, that we can fight together, and it'll all be over, no one else has to die, but it sounds like a good plan. Amen? Now, if the Goliath actually was about four foot tall and weighed soaking wet about a hundred pounds, uh, there'd probably been a lot of people say, you know what? I think I can whip him. I'm just going to go out and defeat him and then they'll be our servants. Wouldn't have been much of a battle, would it? Wouldn't have been much of a victory for God or for Israel. But no, Goliath was, was taller and bigger, heavier, probably more fierce than anybody in Israel. And it wouldn't have been any great thing if he little bitty, but it would be a great thing if he was great and tall. And so the idea there is, we know the rest of the story uh, from uh, chapter uh, 17, verse four, uh, 49 through 54, how the Goliath gets defeated. And who defeats Goliath? Well, we've got a ruddy, small youth Somebody's not fashioned for war. He has no armor. He has no sword. He has got no spear. Amen. All he's got is a sling and a few smooth stones uh, to fight Goliath. Now, if David is able to destroy Goliath with the little bit that he's got and the little bit that he is, then there has to be somebody helping David in order for him to defeat this great big giant. Amen? Would you agree with me on that? If this little fellow that's not fashioned for war is able to defeat this man that is, that's bigger than a mountain, with his little bit of weaponry that he's got, no armor, just a slinging stone, then there's got to be somebody on his side. David said, you come against me with a sling. Uh, the glass said, sling and a sword. I come against you, David said, in the name of the Lord. And so he's got somebody uh, that's bigger than Goliath. He's got somebody uh, that's bigger than the Philistine army. He's got somebody uh, that's bigger than the nation of Israel, bigger than Asia, bigger than Europe, bigger than America, bigger than the United States of America, bigger than the universe. He's got God on His side. No matter how small you are, if God's on your side, you're the winner. Amen. Amen. You're the winner. And so the cry of the ages has been, give us a man. God's looking for a man. America's looking for a man. The Tennessee is looking for a man. And my friend, your family is looking for a man. Somebody uh, that will stand up and show them God. Show them Jesus Christ uh, so that they've got somebody they know can lead them into the promised land, into the hope, and into the presence of God. Somebody 
uh, that's going to help them to overcome uh, the bounds that are upon them, uh, the chains that are on them, uh, the discovery that we've got today uh, that people are being bound by sin, somebody uh, that's able to release them and set them free. Amen? And for that, I want us to look in the book of Genesis for a real quick reading. In Genesis chapter 1, go to chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 1, uh, we've got uh, the first verse of Scripture, in the beginning, God. Alright, so we've got God in the very first book of Scripture, alright? In the Holy Bible, it all begins with God. Now, God doesn't begin. He's eternal. He's always been, right? And so in the beginning, God. So in Genesis chapter 1, we have God. In Genesis chapter 2, we see that God made man. And so we get to chapter 2, we've got God and we've got man. We get into chapter 3 and we've got God and we've got man and we've got the devil. We, well, he had to show up sooner or later anyway, right? And so we've got God, man, and the devil. And if you read in Genesis chapter 3, uh, looking at a couple of verses of Scripture, uh, we find out that Adam and Eve listened to the devil. Uh, they disobeyed God. They become spiritually lost. And they run and hide themselves. When God starts searching for them, God finds them. They call out to God. Uh, says that they had sinned. They come short of His glory. And then they said that we're naked. And they were ashamed because they disobeyed God. And God covers them up with some fig leaves. And they do that, my friends, some fig leaves. And then God kills an innocent animal. And that blood, shed blood, covers their sin. And God gives them a little bit of victory. But if we read in Genesis chapter 3, it looks like that the devil has complete and total victory over God, over man, and the universe or the world as it was. So it looks like uh, the human beings are doomed uh, because they've been given in to the devil. Now here it is, G Genesis 3 and verse 15. And God tells the devil, and I will put enmity between thee, the devil, and the woman, uh, the, the one that he had formed, Eve, and between thy seed, uh, the children of the wicked, and her seed, which is Jesus Christ, it the seed shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so the promise from God is that devil, it may look like you've won, but there's going to come one uh, that I'm going to send uh, that's going to defeat you and put you in your place. Yeah, you're going to be trouble for him. You're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. That's the idea uh, that God has for it. But it doesn't end there. Look at Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the, from the Lord. All right, so there's still, man is still trusting God after that God killed an innocent animal and clothed them with the skin of that animal. Go to chapter 4, verse 25 and 26. And Adam knew his wife again uh, because Abel had been killed by Cain and bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said, she hath appointed me, he said she hath appointed me another seed, another offspring, instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. Verse 26, And the said to him also, There was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Or, in other words, now that we've got enough people together uh, to form a community of faith, Adam and Eve and whoever else said, and now Enoch or Enos, uh, they begin to call upon the Lord as a community of people that are trusting God uh, for their day by day going along. Not nothing different from us. Uh, the Bible says that man does not live by bread alone, amen, a daily portion of bread, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Are you with me so far? Because God and man, America, the world, the United States, Tennessee, and our homes 
and families are looking for a man uh, to stand up in the middle of the war. And so God is looking for Adam to stand up and be a man in the war. Uh, God, or uh, Goliath, was looking for a man uh, to stand up in the war and, and show them who that God was. And David did just exactly that. And so we look around today in our country, we look in the Bible, and it's been the call of the ages uh, that God is looking for a man uh, that will stand up and be the leader uh, that God knows we need in our country, in the other countries, in our state, our states, and in uh, the, our, our homes, and in our families. God's looking for someone. Men, it's time. Uh, women, it's time uh, for us to take our God-given responsibility and place uh, to stand up and be identified as children of God and to stop letting the devil defeat us on every hand that we take. Now, you may lose a battle from time to time, but by the help and power of God, you don't have to lose the war. Amen? Amen. Uh, because what we're looking at, uh, this battle between Goliath and David was not just a physical battle. It was that, but it was also a spiritual battle. Uh, when Goliath said, uh, this day I defy the armies of God, he was saying, God, as your protector, as God that's ruling over you, as God that's got control and power, you say that He is God of the universe, I defy Him as well. That's the underlying tone of that. And we got today uh, where the uh, countries uh, that are Muslim and are communist uh, that come against the United States and our Western way of living and our freedoms and our God, Judeo-Christian heritage, uh, whenever they come against us, they're not just fighting us. Uh, Paul put it so well uh, when he talked about putting on the whole armor of God. He said, you're not fighting flesh and blood, amen, but principalities against powers, against the rulers of darkness, against wickedness of the rulers of this day. Uh, Paul put it in perspective. It's not uh, Muslims. It's not the, uh, the different nationalities and people that we're fighting. We're in, yeah, physical war as a country, but we're also in a spiritual war as in our family. Amen. And we need to make sure that our children, we talked about it in Sunday school class, know whose side we're on and what Jesus really means to us. Uh, there's a fellow that's doing politics on the television that's running for governor in Tennessee and he says his faith means more than anything else to him in this world. Well, I hope that's true. Here's something else I hope. I hope it means the same to you this morning. That your faith in Jesus Christ means more than the rest of the world means to you. Amen. Because that's what Scripture tells us is the way that it ought to be. It does not take away from you being a husband or a wife or a grandfather, a grandmother, a neighbor from your family. Amen. What it does, it enhances that relationship. It makes it better. If we got a Christian born again president of the United States, it would make our country greater. Amen. If we got a governor of our state that was born again, washed in the blood, it would make our state better. It would enhance all of it. If we had a man, a woman in our homes, in our families that love Jesus Christ, was born again, washed in the blood, it would make our homes better. Would you not agree? Amen. So being a Christian just enhances everything that it atta uh, attaches itself to. It's kind of like what Jesus said, ye are the salt of the earth. And so salt does what? It preserves, it enhances, it flavors, amen, all the fun things uh, that salt does. As a Christian, whatever your responsibility is, President, governor, a family man, whatever it is, it makes whatever you're attached to greater. Doesn't take away from it. In fact, Jesus Christ being in your heart makes it better. Amen. It makes it better. It makes it a better world. I think about the West. We live in our country, the United States of America. The more Christians there are, 
the better everyone is off. Amen. And I believe that this morning. If the more Christians there are in the United States, the better well off everybody in the United States is. Uh, but the more sinners there are, uh, the more lost people there are, and all of the things that are the world that come with them, the worse America is. Amen. The worse our families are. Uh, if our family and our church and our state are all going down, then we need to expect it to have the flavor and the glory of Christ upon it because it's going away from Jesus. But when it is enhanced by God and Jesus Christ by righteousness and the blood, by sanctification and justification, it is better this morning. It might far better than what it would be in other ordinary circumstances. So in Genesis chapter 3, remember that God said that the woman's seed would prevail, would overcome uh, the devil's seed. Now think about Moses. On uh, Real quickly, I'm not going to do a whole lot of reading past this point. <clears throat> but I think about Moses and uh, uh, the man of the season, uh, the man for the time, uh, whenever that it was that God said, I want to lead my children out. And Brother Gary talked about the great I am of Moses by the burning bush in the backside of the uh, desert by the mountain there. Uh, Moses uh, was, uh, saw a bush burning, went to that bush to behold it, and he saw the bush that was on fire, but it wasn't being consumed. And God spoke to Moses outside of the bush and told him he wanted to go to Egypt and let my people go. And then Moses said, Who shall I say sent me? And then God said, You tell them that I am hath sent the amen. Uh, the one God that is God. Amen. Uh, that's kind of a short way to put it. The one God that is God. Amen. With all the false gods of Egypt, you tell Moses the one God that there is, a real God has sent you to let my people go. And Moses did exactly that. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and all the story that goes with that went to the Hebrew people. Finally, uh, they were able to be released. They got out and away from there and they had a man at that particular time that was going to lead them out of bondage into the freedom uh, that God has to enjoy for everybody uh, that comes to Him. Secondly, I think about those four boys in Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. Amen. Uh, they didn't bend, they didn't bow, and they didn't burn. Amen. Uh, Daniel said, we're not going to eat your dainty meat. Uh, they wouldn't eat the meat that was provided them as they were being promoted to wise men in Babylon because it was offered to what? false God and they said we'll not partake of that meat you just give us some vegetables and we'll be happy we'll be better we'll be smarter we'll be fatter we'll be more <laughs> amen we'll be better than all the rest of them that eat that old meat sacrifice to idol when they got done down to it but they examined them they were brighter and smarter uh, than the others were and they looked fairer in their flesh than the others did. Where's the reason why they were smarter? And because they knew God. Let me go ahead and tell you this right off. If you know Jesus Christ, you're smarter than the rest of the world. Amen. 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 Now the world may not like that, but it's the truth. Amen. And if you know Jesus Christ, amen, you're fairer than the rest of the world. You're smarter than the rest of the world. It doesn't mean that you're a smart aleck. Some people may think I am, but it, here's the point. If God is on your side, if you love Jesus Christ as He's in your heart and life, He's able to give you wisdom that the world doesn't have. In the book of John, chapter 14, I'm going to go away, and when I go away, I'll send you another comforter, and He will guide you into all truth and righteousness. And Jesus said, if I go away, I'm going to send Him, and when I go away, greater things shall ye do, because the Holy Spirit has come into the church. And when a person gets born again, they get filled with the knowledge and person of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So that makes them smarter and makes them able more. Now, I can't still uh, add uh, real quickly a thousand plus a hundred billion, twenty million, two hundred and seven. Amen? Uh, that, that's not what we're talking about. 
uh, but that's smarter in the things of God. Uh, God is able to bring intelligence and wisdom to our heart and mind at the time that we need it. Amen. Uh, being in bondage in Egypt, being set free. Uh, Daniel being in uh, Babylon and him being able to be free in that kind of a society. I want you to think about that for just a moment. We live in one of the greatest countries in the world that has ever been. In fact, we have more privileges of freedom. We have more rights, amen, even though a lot of them are being stripped away from us and uh, they're not as free as they once were. We still live in the greatest country uh, that's ever been in the world. Amen. And so, yeah, God has blessed the United States of America. It was established on the freedom of religion and of principles uh, that we are all ordained by God to, with a free will to make up our choice as to who we're going to serve, what we're going to do. Amen. God has blessed the human beings uh, with knowledge enough to decide to choose right and wrong. Uh, the Bible said choose life that you may live. And so it's a choice that God has given. He's given us that free ability to make up our mind which we which we were going to go. And then Daniel, Shadrach, and Abednego, they made up their mind that they're not going to bow down to the music. They're not going to bow down to a false god, to an idol. They're not going to give up what they believe or if it cost them their life. Uh, saying that our God is able to deliver us, but if He doesn't, we're still not going to bow. That needs to be the attitude of every born-again Christian. We're not going to give in to the devil. Daniel, Shadrach, and Abednego, they showed them God. They showed them a God that was able. Amen. Same thing in Jesus Christ. Again, John chapter 14, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen. I do believe that Jesus was the express image of God. God being a spirit, Jesus being able to be in physical form so that when we look at Jesus, we understand who the Father is. Amen. And so the idea there is that, yeah, Moses, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they showed them God, they showed them Jesus, and they were the men for the particular time that God needed them to be, needed us to be today. Amen. And so when we go into the New Testament, I'm the one uh, that's going to bruise the head of Satan and, and crush him and defeat him. Uh, think about in the book of Acts chapter 7 how that Stephen, when he's being stoned, he saw Jesus standing on the right hand side of God the Father. He saw the seed, amen, uh, that was there. Paul on the road to Damascus and he struck down, or struck blind, falls off of his beast and hits the ground and Jesus appears to him and Paul sees the seed on the road to Damascus, amen. Uh, the John tells us in the book of Revelation uh, that he is in the spirit on the Lord's day and the seed appears to him in a vision and tells him things that's going to happen, things that's going to come to pass and John sees and understands by vision the seed of God. We go back now to the book of Genesis chapter 15 and we remember what God told him I told Eve and told Adam and told the devil uh, that there's going to come a person an individual, the seed of the woman, it shall bruise thy head, you shall bruise his heel, the seed heel. Amen. Oh, remember the Goliath and the Philistines. They're not no more. They didn't bow down and they didn't become subject to and servants of Israel. No, they said that they were defeated. Goliath said that they would. Well, you can't find any Goliaths today. Amen. You can't find any Philistines. Uh, there are not any around today. Uh, they're all dead. Uh, there's not a Philistine one to be found anywhere in the whole world. Amen. They're all in their graves. All the Philistines are in the grave. Uh, but Daniel lives on. Uh, David lives on. Moses lives on. Aaron lives on. Stephen lives on. Paul lives on. Uh, John the Revelator lives on today. And because my friend Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you want to read the rest of the story, 1 Samuel 17, 49 through 54, uh, David finishes off Goliath, takes his head off, and places it uh, in a place where, where that he's at. 
uh, so uh, Lot lost his head and lost his life. In John chapter 8 and verse 32, uh, the Bible said, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. But David knew the truth. Moses knew the truth. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they knew the truth. And they believed that their lives were in God's hand. And that God was in control of their lives and what was going to happen to them. Would to God today that people would believe that God's in control. Amen. Even though in time it looks like everything's out of control, it's not out of control. God knows what's going on. Before God said, let there be light, He already knew what today would hold for me. He knows what today would hold for you. None of these things are hidden from God's eye. Maybe hidden from our eye, but God knows all about it. Now, sometimes uh, people think, uh, well, is it possible that God can know all those things about everybody, saved and unsaved, in every second of the day? Yeah, He can. Amen. He's God. When you think about God, don't think about persons. Don't think about people. Don't think about something that somebody fashioned and stuck up on their dashboard or made a, an idol and put it in a niche in their home or put in the camel's furniture. That's not God. That's small G. I'm talking about capital God. Amen. The God that is. The God that made the universe. The God that made the stars and threw them out and placed them in their place. That God. Amen. Uh, the God that knows everything about us today. That God. And He said in John chapter 8 and verse 36, If the Son shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. What's it mean to be free indeed? To be free indeed it means to be free, not just in word. <coughs> the Pharisees and the Sadducees in John chapter 8 I said, we were never in bondage to any man. We're free. We're the children of Abraham. And they were in bondage to Rome right at that particular time. They'd been in bondage to Egypt. They'd been in bondage to Assyria. They'd been in bondage to Babylon. They were in bondage to Greece. They'd been in bondage throughout all their history. But the greatest bondage that they had was sin because they did not have the righteousness of God upon them. Same thing with us today. The greatest bondage that you and, ever, you and I will ever experience is that because of what sin does to us. I believe that sin is more powerful than a tornado. I believe that sin is more destructive than a hurricane. More destructive than an earthquake. More destructive than a tsunami. All these things kill life by the hundreds and thousands at their particular time. But sin has cast millions into hell. Sin has destroyed homes and families and governments and nations. <coughs> Sin is the greatest force that we ever need to think about and have control over us. But it's Jesus Christ that's able to break that bondage of sin. America needs a man. Tennessee needs a man. But it doesn't need to stop there. Our homes and our families need a man uh, that's rooted in the Word of God. Settled on the promises in the Bible. Fashioned in righteousness after the Word of God. A man that's bold enough and strong enough and, and knows enough about who he is in Christ to not be ashamed. Uh, the song talked about it. I appreciate the Statue of Liberty. I thank God for the cross. Amen. Thank God for the cross. The old really cross where the Jesus as the Lamb of God, the Savior of the world, died for my and your sins. Died for your sins and mine that we might have freedom today. Those Jews that got saved in Jesus' time and after He was Healed, buried, rose, and ascended. Those Jews, even still in bondage to Rome, 
or set free indeed. Not just in word, but in deed. Their spirits were set free. Their souls were set free. How's your soul? And how's your spirit today? Have you been set free from the bondage of sin? He's able. Have you been dealing with something? Controlled by something? Has it kind of got you bound? And sometimes you feel like you're overcome by it, by something. We've got somebody that's more powerful than anything. Your face, amen. As we stand, the invitation number. Page 375.